Good morning, and welcome to today's daily devotion. My name is Jo, and I'm a member of the St Swithin's Night Church congregation. I'm going to speak a little and then share a song. Today's passage is Deuteronomy chapters 23 to 25, a long section which I'm not going to read in full. And a tricky section because it's describing a set of laws that seem very far from our modern experience. The heading of a large part of this passage in my Bible just says miscellaneous laws. But every part of the Bible is there for a reason, so let's pray that God can teach us from his miscellaneous laws today. Lord God, your Old Testament is so far removed from our daily experiences, but we know that the story of your people Israel was written to benefit those who came afterward. Give us insight into your words so that our time in the book of Deuteronomy today will teach us and shape us to be more like you. Amen. So when I first looked at this passage, it felt a little unfair. It's my first ever devotion after all, and I get these impenetrable rules. But as often happens with the Bible, spending a bit of time with the text changed my mind. This passage is brilliant. It's encouraging and it has so much to teach us. I realise that at the moment, we're all actually very familiar with the discussion of miscellaneous laws. In fact, I almost guarantee that everyone watching this has recently considered or discussed the specifics of certain laws with all the fervour of a Jewish rabbi. Who among us has not plotted a precise five kilometre radius from our address in the hope that it overlaps with a friend's? Now, Taken as individual pronouncements, the COVID restrictions, or indeed Deuteronomy's laws, can seem arbitrary, nonsensical, or just plain unfair. Why is it five people, not ten? Who exactly counts as an essential worker? What exactly is wrong with drinking while standing up? And while we're at it, why are Ammonites and Moabites excluded from the assembly to the tenth generation, but Egyptians only to the third generation? When you're pinching some of your neighbour's grapes, does a bag or a pocket count as a basket? And what exactly is wrong with a man refusing to marry his brother's widow? Now, all of these might be legitimate questions, but it's much harder to get a satisfactory answer if we just focus on the individual statement. That's the very thing Jesus chastised the Pharisees for doing, obsessing over the tiny details of shoulds and shouldn'ts, while ignoring the overarching purpose of the law. <clears throat> we can easily forget that these rules are painting us a picture of a disease, how it spreads, who it might affect, and how we can play a part in getting rid of it from our community. In one case, the disease is COVID-19. In the other case, it's sin. But the principles remain the same. When you take several steps back, to see the underlying purpose, then the specifics make far more sense. Restricting vertical drinking makes more sense when you realise it's not really about being vertical or about drinking, but basically about limiting how much strangers can breathe on one another, as are many of the COVID restrictions really. So rules about marrying a brother's widow make more sense when you understand that a widow without children was very vulnerable and that having a son to inherit your land was fundamental to the stability of Israelite society. So let's look at this passage not for specifics, but for the framework behind these laws. What are the patterns that emerge? Here are some that I found. There are rules about worship and about conduct in the camps when they go to war. These teach the Israelites about holiness, about purity, and about acting like a chosen people. There are various rules about marriage. Like the one about the widow, they're emphasising the seriousness of the marriage covenant and making sure that people have children to carry on their family line. The passage speaks of being fair and generous. If a slave has taken refuge with you, do not hand them over to their master. Don't charge a fellow Israelite interest and you must have accurate and honest weights and measures. When the passage speaks of justice, it says there must be proper courts, which are for everyone, not just for those who can afford it. Do not deprive the foreigner or orphan of justice, 
remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Because, of course, in Egypt, they had no legal rights and no protection from the whims of the pharaoh, and they know what that felt like. And yes, beating is prescribed as a punishment, but the judges must, must watch the results of their judgment, and there is a limit to how much someone can be beaten. Perhaps most of all, this passage speaks of protecting the vulnerable. Do not take a millstone as security for a debt, because that's taking away someone's livelihood. Do not kidnap or enslave a fellow Israelite. Make sure you pay your poorest workers on time, because you know they're depending on it. Don't harvest so thoroughly that there's no food left for those who don't have their own farmland. And we all know that principle from the story of Ruth. So, seen like this, it matters less whether we've never seen a millstone or that we don't have olives to harvest. It matters less that flogging is an archaic punishment and leprosy is no longer a common problem. With a little thought, the intent of these laws is still clear to us. Our God wants the world to work a certain way. And unlike the cultures surrounding ancient Israel, that way was not based on power, violence or oppression. It was based on generosity, respect, unselfishness and truthfulness. It was based on understanding the effect your actions would have on others. For an ancient rule book that most people would assume was barbaric and outdated, that's really pretty impressive. I'd like to live in that society. And if the Israelites could work towards such a society, how much more equipped are we to live God's way? I'm going to sing you a song now, and then go ahead and read through this passage for yourself. What kind of a picture does it paint for you of the character of God that he would set these kind of rules? How does it point you towards Jesus? What can it teach you about how you conduct your life and relationships today? Thank you. 